the mountain that I am walking on now stands at 7,000 feet above sea level. It's a limestone outcropping that overlooks just about everything in the surrounding area. It is one of the tallest peaks of the Taurus mountain range, a belt of limestone mountains that runs through the Adiyaman province in southern Turkey. Created by the collision of the African and Eurasian tectonic plates, the Taurus mountain range runs 350 miles, and composed of ancient limestone deposited millions of years ago, the range is also home to some of the largest cave systems on Earth. In fact, it is this very tectonic boundary that is responsible for the earthquakes experienced in Turkey and Syria earlier this year. And I cannot stress enough how thin the air is up here. Having spent the last few days in the Anatolian lowlands, uh, coming up to this peak is uh, definitely a challenge. But what makes this site more amazing than just its spectacular views is the fact that it is home to a spectacular archaeological site one whose scale and complexity has actually earned it a spot in the UNESCO World Heritage Sites. Howdy friends, my name is Milo Rossi, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you to the ancient mountain of Nemrut. The limestone that the Taurus mountain range is composed of was deposited around 65 million years ago. At that time, this part of the world would have been submerged beneath a shallow sea. Over the course of millions of years, this body of water dried up and was eventually uplifted through tectonic activity. The earth beneath this mountain range is rich with minerals like iron, copper, and lead, and because of its position in relation to the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, has seen human habitation for thousands of years. As we were preparing to come to this site, I have always known that it's like on top of a mountain and I'm like oh yeah Mount Nemrut you know it's we're gonna go up to a mountaintop it's gonna be up there but nothing really prepared me for just how high up we actually are if you look out to the shoulder off my shoulder to the right here you can see the mountain range that we had to pass through in order to get here and when we were originally passing around this mountain range that you can see in the distance I thought that that is the peak that we were going to be going to uh, it was only after coming through badly on that side that we actually could see this mountain and you know it's only standing on top of it that we can see that this peak just dwarfs everything around we are currently at 6,765 feet and climbing, and it shows. The air up here is thin, and having gone to the previous archaeological sites that are all in much lower lands, uh, this one is certainly a challenge. Uh, and it's made all the more entertaining by this enormous stretch of steps that lead all the way to the top of the mountain. We are now at uh, 6,977 feet and we are nearing the summit and you can actually see it just above me and now you may notice uh, it looks a little more uh, unusual than kind of all of the stones in the surrounding area and that would be because that is a man-made summit and people seem to have this weird fascination with taking what nature does and then just trying to do something slightly more impressive so i find it absolutely hilarious that they have you know gone to the top of the highest peak in the area and just made like an anthill on top of it on the shoulders of giants i guess <laughs> we made it. <laughs> oh my god, look at this. <laughs> no way, dude. <laughs> That's well worth the climb. That's unbelievable. Wow. <laughs> Mount Nemrut has been inhabited by humans for thousands of years. Because of its position in the Fertile Crescent, it has played host to countless civilizations throughout time. Some of the oldest people that we know of to have inhabited these mountains were the Hittites, which some of you may remember from your history books as being one of the first civilizations to discover and produce iron. However, the most striking archaeological feature of Mount Nemrut bears a more Hellenistic and Persian influence. The funerary and cultic complex that we see behind me was built in about the uh, first century BCE. This site was uh, commissioned by Antiochus I uh, after the Greek conquest of the area, um, and it has a pretty unique style compared to a lot of other sites around here with a mix between Hellenistic, Persian, and Anatolian influences. Um, as we walk through this site, we can see not only depictions of Antioch himself, but also both uh, Greek and Persian gods. This site highlights an interesting meeting of cultures in the ancient world. While Mount Nemrut does depict many Greek gods, many of them are clad in Persian clothing. This just further goes to show how this part of the world was such a melting pot at this time in history. 
behind me here is the head of King Antioch. Antioch was uh, a fan of uh, constructing large monuments to the gods in a very high points in his land to show his uh, connection and his affiliation with them. You can see here that he has depicted himself seated alongside them. Although, even he didn't have the audacity to position himself in the center, as he is the one who is sitting the farthest to the left. Situated second from the left is the head of Comagene, or if you're an American, a Comagene, or Comagene, if you really don't know what you're doing, like me. I swear I did not break this sign, it was like this when I got here. Comagene was the goddess of fertility, a status which is made apparent by her crown, which is woven out of fruit and flowers. In her lap, she actually had a bundle of pomegranates, but the main torso of the statue was destroyed in a lightning strike in the, I believe in the 60s. Yeah, gods were not happy about that one. And lightning is actually a perfect segue into our next statue. Situated at the center, as you will not be surprised, is none other than Zeus himself. Who's your boy? Is your boy Zeus. The statue of Zeus is the largest at the Mount Nemrut funerary complex. It is situated front and center of all of the gods, and towers more than a shoulder's height above all of them. I think it's fairly safe to say that I don't need to exactly explain who Zeus is, uh, and you can also probably infer it by the fact that he is the largest and the most center of all of the statues. Off of Zeus's right shoulder is the statue of Apollo. Uh oh Off of Zeus's... Oh yeah, that is his left shoulder. Off of Zeus's left shoulder is the statue of Apollo. Live <laughs> fact checking. <laughs> <laughs> this is why I need you here. I need you to be able to tell my left from my right. <laughs> Apollo's statue has more youthful features than Zeus, who sports a massive beard and some spectacular sideburns. But Apollo is portrayed as being clean-shaven and wearing a beautiful pointy hat. Wow, I do like his crown. Yeah, that's pretty sick. Yeah, the band around his head is what is known as a diadem. Apollo was the god of uh, poetry, music, and art, and I think that you could tell that just by the fact that he's wearing such a spectacular headpiece. And last but not least in our statuary row, we have the head of Heracles. As the son of Zeus, Heracles portrayed strength. He was a symbol of mankind's resolve and his dominion over all around him. You'll also notice that in his torso, he is armed, carrying a spear in his left hand. There's also a couple honorable mentions that sit to the flank of these uh, main characters. On this side, we have an eagle and a lion head, and I believe it's actually mirrored on the- oh no, there's only an eagle on the other side. But on this side, we have an eagle and a lion, on the other side is another eagle. You will notice that every single one of the statues at Mount Nemrut has been decapitated. These heads were created to be on the enormous stone torsos that you see above me. And there are several theories as to why this is. There are some theories that it was done as sort of a ritualistic decapitation, and it had some sort of significance to the site itself. Uh, but there is a more running theory, and one that I am a little bit more uh, willing to believe, that these were done sort of uh, when a new influence came to this area, and the statues were decapitated because they were either heathenistic or they were seen as being some form of sacrilege. This desecration of a site is known as iconoclasm, the concept that it is important to destroy all iconography that supports a differing religion or political view. Examples of iconoclasm can be found all throughout the world, from the destruction of idols by early Christians, to the desecration of indigenous American sacred sites by the conquistadors, to even contemporarily the destruction of archaeological sites by terrorist groups like ISIS. While its motivations and perpetrators have changed throughout time, the concept of iconoclasm Iconoclasm has irreversibly changed our world. But either way, at some point in their history, these statues had their heads removed, uh, uh, you know, set back up now for our viewing pleasure. What's up, guys? Are you enjoying the video? Because you better be. I'd like to introduce you to the sponsor of this video. It's me. I'm the sponsor of this video. You want to know why? Because I wrote a book. As some of you may know, I wrote this book over here, the one that's right here. It's called The Encyclopedia of the Weird and Wonderful. And uh, at the time of me recording this, it is the number one best-selling book on Amazon's uh, trivia section, an achievement I never thought that I would hold. But here I am holding this. The Encyclopedia of the Weird and Wonderful is a collection of weird and wonderful facts about history, humanity, and uh, humankind as a whole. You want to learn about some of the oldest board games in the world, I got you. Want to learn how to make uh, how, to, how to make dye out of cow piss? Of course you do. Have you ever wondered whether or not Neanderthals like finger painting? Of course you have. Are you kidding me? The Encyclopedia of the Weird and Wonderful is available for pre-order now. Link to that is in the description of this video. Now this book has kind of a unique structure and format that I wanted to try, but I'm not going to bore you with it here because you're clearly already watching something that, you know, was interesting or whatever. But if you want to learn more about the Encyclopedia of the Weird and Wonderful before you inevitably pre-order it, you can check out this video right here. I'd like to thank me for sponsoring this video. And now, let's get right back to it.
it is no small wonder why the ancient people decided to build here. From this vantage point, you can see the edge of the Taurus Mountains stretching into the Anatolian lowlands. And what you now see as a lake is actually the damned Euphrates River, meaning that from this mountaintop, you are overlooking the cradle of civilization itself. The philosophy behind building here is, on this terrace, the east side, the gods would be the first thing that the sun would see when rising in the morning. And on the west side of the mountain, they would be the last thing that the sun would see before it sets. Wow, that is... I wanna go see what this is. Okay, we're gonna take a quick detour, because this looks interesting. I don't know what this is all about. It's made out of fruity pebbles. God of psychedelics. <laughs> yeah, really, my god. He was off tweaking when... Look at this oh, that's thing. It. Damn. Snap, crackle, pop. That's beautiful. To my left is the most prominent feature of Mount Everut, the enormous man-made pile of stones that make up its central burial complex. Now, it is just spectacular to me, not only the size of the colossal statues which sit just on the other side, but just how enormous this pile of stones is. I am sorry about the wind up here, there is nothing I can do about that. But this burial tomb is especially interesting. While many burial sites of the ancient world have been raided for archaeological knowledge or personal gain, this one had a unique problem. When archaeologists tried to explore this tomb, they were faced with a massive challenge presented by cave-ins, and so the central burial chamber was never reached, with these loose stones almost working to continually heal all of the attempts to dig further and further into the tomb. So it's kind of amazing to think that in this pile of stones behind me is a completely undiscovered burial chamber that we know almost nothing about. Currently the least exciting but most windy of the terraces is the North Terrace. The North Terrace features this beautiful corrugated steel building and nothing of archaeological significance that we can see. But behind this block that I'm about to pry open... The North Terrace also has this long line of broken stelae, uh, which are very heavily weathered from being exposed on this mountaintop. 2,000 years. As far as the uh, terraces go at Namrut, uh, this one is probably the one that is the least photogenic. Year after year of snowfall has caused the stele to fall over all in the same direction. While this is unfortunate for archaeological context, it has revealed an interesting part of their construction. You can actually see here the base into which the stele would have been placed, as well as this raised bottom that would have fit into that spot. It's interesting because we actually saw similar construction like this at Gobekli Tepe, so this style of constructing and uh, holding up large stones has been something which has been in practice for literally tens of thousands of years. The reason that this building sits here now is because the North Terrace is the site of an ongoing conservation project. Within this corrugated metal building is a large-scale relief of the constellation Leo. What's so unique about this particular carving is that it is insanely accurate. Archaeologists working alongside astronomers have been able to analyze this carving and be able to give an exact date to the site, finding that the carving depicts the night sky as it was on the very date of Antioch's coronation. I've talked before about using stars to uh, date archaeological sites, and in previous instances where I've talked about this, the use of stars to date sites has been nefarious at best. So it's important to look at this site as being an actual representation of a constellation that we know is a constellation, and that being a much more reliable way to date a site. Whereas hypothetically looking at a single dot and saying that it's a star is not a good way to date a site. No shade and a lot of wind. Let's keep moving. We are now on the West Terrace, which faces the direction of the setting sun. The West Terrace is composed exactly the same way as the East Terrace, consisting of all of the same statues in the same order. However, the statues here are a little bit smaller, and yet they are better preserved. If you look behind me, you can see that many of the statuary heads are in a much uh, better condition than a lot of the statues on the other side of the uh, funerary complex. Uh, oh shit, what the hell the fuck do you say? Come on. How do you do it? How do you say it? Komagene. Komagene. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> See, this is, I need you around more. This is great. For example, uh, Komagene's fruit uh, crown is far better preserved. You can actually see the uh, pomegranates along the side of it, as well as uh, a bunch of grapes. The head of Antioch himself is also much better preserved, and you can see a lot more detail than probably would have been consistent on the statue on the other side, had it not been absolutely obliterated. And something that we see at both uh, this terrace and the terrace on the other side is the depictions of both eagles and lions. Uh, to my right here is uh, one of the eagle heads, and just on his other side is a lion head. While these are not the heads of gods, they are seen to be protectors, with both the eagle and the lion representing strength and protection over this site. 
The head of Zeus is also much better preserved on the other terrace. Uh, the entire bottom of Zeus's head was broken off when it collapsed, and so there was no uh, beard or much of his lower half of his face preserved. Uh, but here you can see the detail uh, in his mustache and in the rest of his facial hair. That's the Nemrut picture right there. If you Google uh, Nemrut, you will see exactly what is behind me. This is like the postcard, uh, postcard picture of the site. You gotta take a picture, prove I was really there. Nemrut is one of the most spectacular and compelling sights that we have seen so far in our travels to Turkey. Oh, Jesus. And the altitude is definitely one that makes it even more uh, enjoyable. And the thing that to me is the most compelling about it is that there is still so much to learn. While we know plenty about the person who designed it and its construction, we know literally nothing about the interior, meaning that for all intents and purposes, the burial chamber at Mount Nemrut remains a complete mystery. However, Mount Nemrut remains a unique site, one that highlights a confluence between Persian, Greek, and Anatolian influences that dominated this area nearly 3,000 years ago. I'd like to thank you all very much for watching. My name is Milo Rossi, Rivers Stay curious, stay inquisitive, and most importantly, remember that sometimes it's okay to have no head. <laughs>